you go. I would like to welcome everyone to our third presentation, as well as to thank all of you for making GGSS Online very successful. I'd like to wish all of you a happy and healthy, safe, prosperous new year. And today I am very much delighted to introduce Dr. Jada Ben Torres, who will be doing a presentation on genetic anthropology of the Lester Antilles. So welcome, Dr. Jada. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, depending on, on where you are. I want to um, actually just thank everybody for, for inviting me to, to talk with the Genealogical Society. This is exciting. I, I actually really like to engage um, with, with other Caribbean people. This is kind of my interest and um, my reason for being, I guess, as a, as a scientist. Also, um, Angus, thank you so much for the invitation and, and for reaching out. I appreciate this. Um, so if there's no other words, I suppose I can just jump in and hopefully we'll have um, plenty of time for, for good conversation. Absolutely. So um, everyone sees the PowerPoint. Uh, so in 2003, the scientific community triumphed with the completion of the first draft of the human uh, genome sequence. So they were able to, to sequence the entire thing. So the work marked a change in the ways in which genetic data was harnessed to learn about human experience. Anthropologists in particular and other scientists could now consider all sorts of other things beyond just the individual idiosequencies or medically relevant traits that were available to learn about the history. In other words, what stories could our DNA tell about our past? Roughly 10 years before the completion of the sequence um, of the entire genome, the very first direct-to-consumer tests went to market. And these tests were patern paternity tests. They actually uh, are still uh, the, the most best-selling direct-to-consumer tests. So with these DTC tests, uh, a person will go to the store, purchase a kit, provide a DNA sample, send that kit back to the testing company, and then get results, all without the guidance of a doctor or, um, for the most part, any sort of regulatory mechanisms. So these sorts of tests, um, inclusive of paternity tests, later ancestry tests were, were developed. It created this huge boom, this huge um, increase uh, in the availability uh, to access your DNA. Um, with these tests, we can learn more about medical histories if, if we're interested, but we could also use these tests to learn about um, our kin. So prompted by the emergence of these different direct-to-consumer companies, some of them you've heard of, like uh, National Geographic had one uh, that, that ended recently. So that, that project was from 2005 to 2019. 23andMe is a leading, uh, in, in, leading in the industry, Family Tree DNA, Ancestry.com, et cetera. Um, but there have all been subtle ways uh, that, that people have changed in which, in which they interact with uh, genetic data and how they think about themselves in relation to one another um, and other uh, biological organisms with these distinct biological pasts. So genetic ancestry tests in particular have received a lot more attention, part, partly due to these edutainment shows. So things like Finding Your Roots or Genealogy Roadshow. So in these shows, as some of you all are um, sure, sure aware, participants uh, will do conventional, use conventional genealogical methods um, and then combine that with genetic genealogy uh, to reach a little bit further uh, in areas where the records sort of just end. So from an anthropological perspective, we can use these tests uh, to address other um, more, more interesting uh, and sort of different, different questions. So when we do these ancestry tests, well, what are the sorts of things that we can learn? Um, from those of you who have taken an ancestry tests, you're aware uh, that from the individual perspective, you can learn more about the geographic origins of your ancestors. Okay, so you have ancestry in different parts of, uh, parts of the world, and you can learn uh, about how that uh, came together. In addition, uh, some of these newer companies are offering ways to connect with people you share DNA with. Uh, so identifying your your genetic kin. I would argue uh, that anything we learn uh, for the individual perspective is best interpreted within a context. So having some knowledge of your family history really helps to enhance um, and explain what uh, the gen genetic results are telling you. 
from an academic uh, perspective or more of a population perspective, we can aggregate a number of individuals together, um, ones that form a population, and then have something to say about how that population um, migrated across geographic space, how they exchange genes with other uh, communities. Uh, we can also use DNA to go back in time to talk about the common ancestry um, of all people. So give us some information about uh, human origins. So if we focus specifically uh, on genetic ancestry testing, I want to spend a few minutes talking about how these tests generally work. So there's two broad categories of genetic ancestry testing. There's uniparental tests okay, and there are these autosomal tests. So uniparental tests sound like uh, what they are. They'll tell us about one parental line. Uh, to do this, we'll use mitochondrial DNA and then we'll use Y chromosome DNA. So mitochondrial DNA is inherited through the mother. Um, so it tells you about the mother's line and then the Y chromosome is paternally inherited. It tells you about the father's line. The second broad category, autosomal tests, these are biparentally inherited and they'll tell us uh, about, uh, in general, uh, the entire sort of family tree. So let's take a little bit closer look here. So the first unilineal test I, I had mentioned was mitochondrial DNA. And uh, as I said, this is informative about the maternal lineage. So in our uh, graphic here, uh, I'm showing you what mitochondria is. So this is a cell, and inside the cell you have your nucleus where DNA generally lives. Inside of the cell we also have something, some uh, organelle, um, that is known as mitochondria. And mitochondria is responsible for energy production in our cells. So for the most part, our cells will have a single nucleus, okay? um, and then it will have uh, multiple copies of mitochondria. Depending on the cell type, you may have many, many, many mitochondria in a cell. Um, in other cell types, you have fewer. Mitochondria, excuse me, is really interesting because it has its own set of DNA. Okay? So it's DNA that is not inside of the nucleus, but instead, instead inside of this, um, this organelle, this, this mitochondria. And everybody has mitochondria. However, you get your mitochondria from your mother. Okay? So if we look over here at our pedigree, we can see at the bottom we've got a male and a female. These two are siblings and they have um, shared mitochondrial DNA. Okay? And this is represented by these blue circles. This is supposed to be your mitochondrial DNA. And you'll notice that these blue circles, this mitochondrial DNA is the same as their mother, okay? also represented by a circle here. And here, this is her mitochondrial DNA, which is the same as her mother. Okay? So when we look at mitochondrial DNA, we're learning only about the maternal, the maternal line. So within mitochondrial DNA, um, there's a segment of it that mutates a lot. We see a lot of different variants. And when we look at it from an evolutionary perspective and, and try and construct a genealogy um, for these mitochondrial DNAs, uh, we can organize them into these, into these groups um, or these genetic families known as haplogroups. Okay? So with haplogroups, they consist of, just like any family, you've got siblings. So a haplogroup can have these closely related um, um, variants or lineages. Okay? So these closely related lineages would be the equivalent of siblings. With siblings in a family, you know, they all kind of look alike, but they look different enough that you recognize them as individuals. Well, it's similar with these haplogroups. These haplogroups will be made up of multiple lineages that looks similar enough that you recognize it as one, one family, okay? So with these mitochondrial haplogroups, uh, we recognize when we look at it, uh, at it from a global perspective that these are generally continent specific, okay? Meaning that if you see or you come up with one um, particular haplogroup, um, there is a part of the world where that's in high concentration. And we generally assume that wherever it is in high concentration, that's the origin. Okay, so to give you an example um, in this image, let's see, we can look at haplogroup L1. So that's represented in black here. And we see that pretty much in sub-Saharan Africa and to a lesser degree in North Africa. So if you happen to have a mitochondrial haplogroup and it belongs to L1, we would say that your mitochondrial ancestry lies in uh, Africa. We can actually get a little more specific. So we can have like L1, 2A, et cetera. So these are the different lineages. And when we start to um, look at that, we can get a better idea or at least narrow down the region uh, within the continent uh, that an individual comes from. Um, I'll share a little bit of data with you uh, a bit later in terms of what I've seen in the Caribbean. Um, but for the most part, I'm seeing a lot of L1s, L2s, L3s. So 
things representing uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, as well as in the Americas. Okay. Um, and depending on where I'm looking in the Caribbean too, I'll see a little bit of ancestry from South Asia. Along the maternal lines, we don't see too much ancestry from Europe, but we will, we'll get to that point um, in a bit. So the second type of unilineal test that we use uh, is the Y chromosome. So the Y chromosome contains all the DNA that makes chromosomal men men. Okay? And this is inherited generally unchanged from father to son. Okay, so here in our little uh, uh, image here, we have a, a picture of the X chromosome, so our other sex chromosome, um, and then the Y chromosome. And you can see kind of the difference, um, difference in size. So in our pedigree over here, um, you can see in the males, these are represented by squares. They're all sharing this red chromosome. This is the Y chromosome. And you see it's inherited um, from father to son, from father to son. So when we look at the Y chromosome, again, we're only learning about... Um, the paternal, paternal lineage. And like mitochondrial DNA, we can look at different variants on the Y chromosome and organize them into these genetic families, these different haplogroups. Okay? So here's a kind of an older map uh, showing the distribution of the different Y chromosome haplogroups. Um, one great example of this is, is if someone belongs to haplogroup QM3, um, so this is represented here in the purple, we would say that they have paternal ancestry, um, likely among the Americas. This is one of those instances where having some context, some general understanding about a person's family history um, is useful. Okay. If you know you have ancestry among the Americas and you come up with Q, we would say, okay, it's likely Native American. On the other hand, if you know you have some ancestry in parts of Asia, we would say, well, you know, this region of Asia is also a likely um, candidate for, for your ancestry, because you can see kind of the, the shared ancestry between East Asia um, and, and the Americas. Okay. So the second broad category of ancestry tests uh, I had mentioned are autosomal tests. With these autosomal tests, these will provide um, a general estimate over uh, the test takers overall ancestry. So it's gonna tell you something about both your mother's side and your father's side. Okay? Um, and this is what has uh, been the most useful, I'd say in the la later last few years. Um, the uniparental tests tend to be a little more re low resolution. With these autosomal tests, you can get uh, finer resolution in terms of uh, more specific areas uh, of the world where uh, a test taker might be from. So the way these autosomal tests work um, in general is that uh, the test companies will look over the genome and test upwards of, I think some of the newer tests are testing over a million. So anywhere between actually half a million and over a million genetic markers across the genome. Those genetic markers are then compared to reference groups. And reference groups are um, populations where we know they haven't moved around a lot. Um, and what, what happens is that you'll compare the test takers DNA to those reference groups and where those reference groups and the test takers overlap where they share ancestry will say that that's where um, you have shared ancestry. Uh, so this is a, a snapshot of someone's 23andMe results um, and what it's showing here is just the basic colors will match up with the geographic areas um, of, of the world. So a few more words on these autosomal ancestry tests. So I mentioned that these newer tests use upwards of half a million genetic markers. Well, the genetic markers that they're generally using are something known as ancestry informative markers or AIMS. Okay? And AIMS or these ancestry informative markers are genetic markers that will differ in allele frequencies across different populations in the world. Okay? So uh, I've got three examples here. We're just going to talk about this last one, FY null. Um, so this particular uh, genetic variant is responsible for producing a specific protein um, on the surface of the red blood cell. And this protein is actually kind of important uh, because it allows entry of a malaria parasite into the cell. So if you make this protein, you are susceptible to malaria. However, um, for um, in particular, actually sub-Saharan Africans, there's been a genetic adaptation and evolutionary change over time where people don't make this um, this protein so that they don't have this protein on the surface of their cell. When you have individuals who don't have this protein on the surface of their cell, they are basically immune to that type of malaria. There's other types of malaria they can get, uh, but that particular type of malaria uh, can infect their cells because there's no entryway into the cell for the parasite. 
Okay, so we can use this as a uh, as a in a, in a uh, an ancestry informative marker. So what I'm showing you here is this particular variant. This one is for making the protein, and what you can see is that in Native American populations, it's basically 100% present. Um, in European populations, it's 99.8% present. However, in African groups, it's it's absent. Okay, basically 0% have it. So what we do is we get these markers that are in high frequency in some parts of the world and very low frequency in other parts of the world, and we'll aggregate them. We'll use many, many, many of them. Um, some of the earliest studies used maybe about 60, and now, as I mentioned, um, current ancestry tests use well over a million of these types of markers. And when we do that, we're able to make these probabilistic assessments as to where your ancestry lies. Okay? And again, it's just using, using markers like this. So that's sort of the, the very basic framework um, of different ancestry um, tests, whether you're looking at uniparental markers or these autosomal or the generalized ancestry. There are several caveats, though, to understanding these ancestry tests. So as I mentioned before, uniparental tests are really only informative about one lineage. Okay, so if you're looking at the mitochondrial DNA, you don't know anything about uh, these members of your family tree. And the same with the Y chromosome. First off, you have to have a Y chromosome, so be chromosomally male, okay? And again, looking just at the Y chromosome, you know nothing about uh, these members of, uh, other members of your, your family tree. So these are, are generally uh, pretty low uh, resolution. A second important point, particularly with the autosomal ancestry tests, are your reference groups. So I mentioned before that with these ancestry tests, a test taker is compared to these reference groups, and then from there we make these statistical assessments uh, of the relationship between the test taker um, and those in the reference group. If your reference group is poorly defined or ill-defined, uh, you'll still get an answer, but it won't be really reliable or believable. So these reference groups are super important to get right. And for those of you who have taken ancestry tests, you've noticed that in the last few years, your results may have changed. And it's spe uh, specifically due to changes in the reference group. Okay? It's not that your DNA has changed or that the tests are bad, but they're refining them by, by improving their reference groups. Um, another interesting uh, caveat uh, to these ancestry tests is this phenomenon known as pedigree collapse. So this is gonna be kind of displayed here in our pedigree. So each individual has two parents, um, and their parents both have two parents, and their parents both have two parents, and it goes back in time, back in time, and back in time. So if we go back 40 generations, we would have over a trillion ancestors in theory. So this is two raised to the power of 40. And then you might be asking yourself at this point, well, how can that be? We're at 7 billion people, and this is the most that's ever existed on Earth. How could each individual, okay, on, the, on this, um, this call here, have over a trillion ancestors? Well, the answer is we, we don't. That was just in, in theory. Um, what ends up happening is that as you go back in time, you're going to find that the same person is the same person on both sides of your family, that you share ancestry um, along both your maternal and paternal lines, but it, it comes to be to, uh, the same person. And this is known as, as pedigree collapse. And this will happen um, over time when you have like, cousin marriages, uh, et cetera. And this is an important point to kind of keep in mind as to uh, what your ancestry test can actually uh, tell you. Uh, a last point that I think is really important mentioning uh, for these ancestry tests would be how do we depict these ancestry estimations? Uh, this has actually been pretty controversial, uh, at least in academic circles, um, because of the potential of um, giving the wrong idea as to what these ancestry tests can say. When you say you have, you know, 94% sub-Saharan African um, ancestry, what are we actually saying? That you share 94% of your, your, your uh, genetics with uh, Sub-Saharan Africans, what does that even mean um, over, over time in terms of thinking about how people have uh, self-identified, how they've moved around? So there are a lot of questions about what are the best ways of uh, presenting this information. And again, this also feeds into this point about what happens when reference groups change and the numbers change. It can be unsettling to many people to see their ancestry estimations uh, changing. So there's some question as to best practices uh, in terms of how to, to depict ancestry estimates. Another important point with these genetic ancestry tests um, is that they don't tell us about our racial identities. Uh, despite the fact that there are some companies that will sell it that way, they will ask, uh, these companies are marketing ancestry tests, hey, what's your ethnicity, what is your race? These are wrong ideas. Race is a social structure. It's something that we, um, as, as a community, 
as, as a people have created and we maintain. Okay, so we look at biological variation and we give it a particular meaning. Okay, race is a social structure and it is experienced. There is no genetic test in the world that can tell you uh, what your race is. Genetic ancestry can be informative about where your ancestors came from, but it doesn't tell you how your ancestors may have self-identified. For those of you who have done ancestry tests, you might have ancestors in your family tree who would likely self-identify in a different way uh, than you do. So race is more about the here and now and how you were brought up, how you were socialized and how um, you understand yourself to be. But genetic ancestry tests don't necessarily tell you uh, about your race. So I'm going to very, very quickly jump into some of the work that I've done. There's there's not enough time to go over um, all of the projects that I've done. Uh, but this is a map highlighting some of the islands um, that I've had the pleasure of, of engaging with and um, meeting people and, and, and involving in some of my uh, genetic work. Uh, a lot of this is based on, I have right over 500 samples from across these islands, and um, these are just as parts of different, different projects. Um, so I'll start with my most recent project, and then I'll work back in time to um, focus really on the Lesser Antilles. So my most recent work has been in Puerto Rico, um, and in this project, it's a collaborative effort um, with myself, um, a cultural anthropologist, as well as a sociologist, both from Puerto Rico. Um, and in this project, we're looking at African ancestry uh, in Afro-Puerto Ricans. This is a, a sort of a larger project, but the idea is to learn more about their African uh, ancestry um, and then interact with different artisans uh, to see how they understand their genetic ancestry. The point or the, the eventual purpose of this project is to create an exhibit in one of the community centers we're working with um, in which that we have the genetic ancestry and then we have uh, the products of different artisans, whether they're musicians, um, painters, poets, how they interpret their genetic ancestry. So this idea is to put science and art in, in communication um, in terms of thinking about um, black experiences uh, in, in Puerto Rico. A second project that I've been involved with, um, in uh, was looking at indigenous uh, communities in Trinidad and, and in St. Vincent. Um, and I've got two papers published here, but I work with the First Peoples Community of, of Arima uh, in Trinidad, as well as the Garifuna Heritage Foundation in, in St. Vincent. And in uh, this project, we found that both of these communities indeed have indigenous ancestry, just as they told us, um, but there were some really interesting caveats in terms of their, their ancestry. Um, we see that the indigenous ancestry in terms of like the mitochondrial and Y chromosome haplogroups, we see some differences between Trinidad um, and St. Vincent. And again, this is probably responsive to the different histories uh, that both of these respective communities uh, have experienced. Trinidad was, was interesting in particular because it really reflected the history of the island where uh, within just the First Peoples community, we saw ancestry of native um Native Caribbean people, we saw ancestry from African peoples, a little bit from European peoples, and a little bit um, from South Asian peoples. Uh, and again, this kind of makes sense in light of what we know uh, in terms of who was coming to Trinidad uh, and, and when. Another project I was involved in uh, was uh, in Jamaica. So in this project, um, I was interested in learning more about um, Maroon oral histories. Okay? So the Maroons uh, descend from um, African peoples who would not be enslaved. Okay, so they ended up in Jamaica, took off to the hinterlands, and set up these semi-autonomous communities. Their oral histories have always said that, you know, the very first Maroons were Taino, or were the indigenous people, and that they shared, they always claimed partial ancestry uh, from the Taino, from, from native peoples. So in this work, I went to a Kampong uh, town and I was able to get 50 people uh, to collaborate with me, to work with me, and I was able to look at their uh, mitochondrial ancestry. And in their mitochondrial ancestry, I indeed, indeed did find uh, evidence of indigenous ancestry among, among the group. So the, the DNA actually supports their, their oral histories. Okay. Um, and then some of the earliest work I did um, was basically a genetic survey uh, of the Lesser Antilles. I think I've, I've samples from six different islands. Um, and in these projects, um, I was able to estimate autosomal ancestry in addition to both mitochondrial um, and Y. Um, so just because we're talking to the gene, I'm talking to the genea, uh, Grenada genealogical group, I want to highlight some of the ancestry results I found uh, for this for this project. So in this project in particular, I um, invited people who identified as African or having African descent uh, to participate. 
Um, so I basically have a little over 50 samples from each island. So this is not a, sla um, uh, a snapshot of the entire island, but instead a subset of, of people, again, who identify as, as uh, Afro-Caribbean. So in Grenada, you could see that the African ancestry is, is relatively high, around 80, 81 percent Native American ancestry, uh, 6.8 percent, and then European ancestry varied. There were two other islands that actually represented uh, more of a, a spectrum, one end of a spectrum. So St. Kitts, um, on the one hand, uh, had a lot of African ancestry, so upwards of 86 percent um, African ancestry and then um, very little uh, Native American uh, to um, European ancestry. Okay? Dominica was on the other end of the spectrum where they had very little uh, ancestry, African ancestry, this is relatively speaking, and then much, much, much higher amounts of Native American ancestry. And again, this makes uh, more sense when we think about uh, the fact that the Kalinago Reserve is on Dominica. In addition, we have to think about the ways in which uh, the French, uh, the Spanish, and the Dutch, and how, how they um, interacted on the islands in terms of running their plantation. Uh, French planters tended to be on the island um, running their plantations. English planters, not so much. And what we see is that in Dominica, we see this opportunity um, for these uh, European ancestries to, to, to kind of come into uh, African descendant uh, groups in ways that we don't see uh, in other islands, in particular uh, English speaking islands. Okay. Um, so this was a very, very brief sort of overview of some of the projects that I've been in. Um, I did recently publish a book with, with my husband and collaborator um, where we talk in more depth about genetic ancestry uh, in terms of some of the projects that we've done, as well as how we use this tool um, to think about our past. Now, there's a lot to be said about genetic ancestry and, and how, you know, the potential dangers of this in terms of reifying race or, or um, making race seem more than it, uh, making it seem that it's biological and then sort of categorizing uh, people. But there's also the potential uh, that genetic ancestry can be used in ways um, that uplift and help communities think about their pasts uh, in different ways. So we highlight some of that uh, in the book. The last things I wanna sort of leave you with are the things that I'm thinking about in, in terms of uh, genetic genealogies. And, and some of these questions uh, you all might have and uh, actually have answers to or at least have thought about. Um, but these are some, some questions that have come across uh, my mind. So the first one I have listed here would be how to use these genetic technologies, um, or if we should, to reconnect kin that may have been separated by um, initially slavery um, and then later on migration. Okay? So, you know, the instances where uh, individuals find out they have second cousins, third cousins, uh, or even siblings they didn't know about, should we be using these technologies in this way? If we are, what are our obligations, if any, uh, to these genetic kin? Another thing I've thought about is how do we reconcile um, these results with family and oral histories, in particular when they don't match? What do we, what do, we do with that? Or um, how do we reconcile these genetic histories when we find out, hey, there's evidence for things that were a little bit ugly? OK, so um, we know from historical records that um, rape, um, for example, is sort of uh, the experience of, of black women um, in the past. And what happens when our genetic data show that this is indeed something that happened? How do we reconcile that? Okay. Another idea that I've thought about and actually one that I've written about would be what does this genetic data do? Is it potentially useful um, in making the case for reparations for both African slavery and indigenous genocide uh, in the Caribbean? Would it potentially be useful or would it just be more uh, div divisive? And then this last point I have, um, and, and I hope that um, you as a genealogical um, society or, or group would think, would think about, is how do you as a community um, take control and hold on to this genetic data uh, to be used in relation to how your community is talked about how it's, it's thought about. Okay? So these are some of the ideas um, that I've um, been, been kind of grappling with, and I'd be interested to know what, what you all think or uh, entertain any other sort of, of question. So um, with that, I always like to thank um, participants in my project, my collaborators, uh, as well as uh, my university, Vanderbilt, um, and National Geographic, who have who helped um, make these studies possible. Um, so with that, I'll stop talking, and I will um, look forward to any sort of questions. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Jada, for, for joining us today. Um, it's really been a pleasure. I think a lot of people have been looking forward to this talk because 
genetic genealogy allows us, you know, that opportunity to explore where we don't have the the actual physical data uh, for, from paper, from, from documents, um, which we lack, you know, in the Caribbean. And also because once you get to slavery, it becomes a block because it's hard to get beyond, you know, the, the mid 1800s, mm -hmm. you know. So I think a lot of people are looking to genetic genealogy to help them get beyond that point if possible, you know. Um, we supposed to have Steve, we seem to have lost Steve, I guess, who yes. had some questions. Um, Philip, do you have any communication with Steve or should no. I go ahead? You can go ahead, you, you can take it away. Okay, okay. Um, Jada, I had a few questions in, in trying to, to look at this, you know, and what it means for us, you know, Caribbean people, Grenadians and, and other people, um, particularly, I guess, in the Les Antilles, you know. Um, we often describe Caribbean society today as a result of the creolization process um, that brought together diverse peoples, sometimes and oftentimes for the region, under very brutal and violent conditions. How is that process reflected in the genetic makeup of the Caribbean peoples today? So as I showed you in that sort of that last slide, um, at least my sampling of um, people from the Lesser Antilles, we do see ancestry from primarily Africa um, and then from Europe. Depending on the island um, that you're on, you might actually see ancestry from other parts of the world. Um, and then those, those estimates actually vary uh, a lot. Um, it warrants additional study, but sort of working hypothesis I have is that those islands that were colonized very early, particularly those by the British, are primarily um, consisting of people with, with mainly African ancestry. Okay? Um, and this is, you know, the way I'm explaining or thinking about it is, is because the ways in which uh, the British uh, did things, they would come into an island, um, relieve it of its indigenous population, whether you know, by directly killing them or inducing them to leave one way or the other. And then they would import um, uh, laborers, Africans, uh, to, to work the land. Um, and as I mentioned, for the most part, a lot of British planters were not uh, in situ. They did not stay there. They hired someone else uh, to run their plantations. Okay? And this contrasts uh, pretty greatly with places like Dominica. So Dominica, uh, Martinique, Guadeloupe, those were French islands, although the British and the French went back and forth um, um, fighting over them. They were initially left for the indigenous population, okay? um, but then eventually um, either England or, or France took, took them over. For those islands that were French for significant periods of time, many of the planters actually lived on the island and this provided opportunities for, um, let's say, mixing. Um, Dominica in particular was interesting because those offspring of mixed marriages or mixed women, let's say, um, they were actually able to capitalize on their European ancestry. So the fathers would educate the kids. They would maybe send them to Europe and bring them back. Um, and what, it, what ended up happening in, in places like Dominica is you see this emergence of a third social class. So you had your um, Africans, you have this sort of colored or mixed class, and then you had your, your white plant plantocracy. Okay? Um, and we actually see that reflected in the DNA. Uh, you'll see that last slide that I showed you uh, that the European ancestry was around 28% um, in uh, the, the people I sampled in Dominica. And again, keep in mind that this is just people who self-identify as Afro-Caribbean. If I had taken a snapshot of just all Dominican people, I'd probably have a, a little bit of a different um, look at things. Uh, but we do see that across the islands, the, the DNA actually reflects the history um, in, in, in ways that you would expect. And the same with Trinidad, with the First Peoples community, really reflecting the history of Trinidad with the, um, the coming together of European, African, Native American, and then South Asian or Indian uh, ancestry. So, so we do see it. Um, I didn't mention it, uh, but with Puerto Rico, uh, my newest project, I'm actually learning more about their African ancestry. And their African ancestry is slightly different than what we see in other parts of the Caribbean. So one of the reference groups I used in um, the Puerto Rico project is from Barbados. Uh, and what I'm seeing is that uh, the people in Barbados, their African ancestry uh, is primarily, I think it's in Lower Guinea, uh, with, with the Puerto Ricans, the Afro-Puerto Ricans, I'm seeing ancestry from Upper Guinea, Lower Guinea, and to a lesser extent, West Central Africa. So it's spread out a little bit different, which again makes sense because the Spanish would have been sourcing their slaves from different parts than the British did, right? right. And so we're seeing this sort of reflected in the ancestry. And this is kind of important when we start to think about, well, what does this mean in terms of how people adapted 
to the Caribbean? What sorts of cultural traditions survived in some places and not other places? Well, when we start to think about, well, it's different Africans that were coming in, different traditions, oral traditions, um, ways of engaging with, with the natural world, we see that it might have been a little bit different. So the African ancestry in the Caribbean is not all the same. It's not as homogeneous as we might be led uh, to, to think about. Um, and again, we see that reflected uh, in, in DNA. That was a really long answer. But yeah, no, no, that, that's great. I, I actually, I, I, I appreciate you know that extent because I think I would not have thought that there would be this difference between St. Kitts and Grenada, but yes, it, it, it's very logical when you think of the fact that the British were always in St. Kitts for most of the time, mm -hmm. and as opposed to Grenada where we did have the French and we did have the, the British after. So we do see some of these differences and we know, you know, I think Fedon's rebellion was probably re responsible for why we probably have a lower count now, you know, in terms of mixed race because they were affected by that rebellion, you mm -hmm. know, so hence we might see less mixed race people as a result, you know, over time, you know, so that I, I appreciate that, that long answer because it does explain, you know, quite a bit, you know. Um, Stephen, uh, do you want to go ahead? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. Um, fascinating um, presentation, Jada. Learn so much. I recently uh, have uh, two DNA tests, one with uh, 23andMe, one with Ancestry DNA. Um, they're slightly different. You talked about these reference groups. Uh, so I wondered whether that um, played a part as to why these results were slightly different between the two. Absolutely. I, I would put, I'd say my last dollar as to why. So these reference groups, particularly with these commercial companies, they will aggregate publicly available data. So in some regards, their data sets or their reference sets are the same. But then they also may use... Um, data from either their customers or they, they had, you know, had a special campaign at some point uh, to collect uh, data that would, would be used in their reference groups. So the reference groups, the composition is a little bit, uh, a little bit different. There might also be slight differences in the algorithms each group uses. Yeah. Um, and, and that will kind of give you, um, give you slightly different results. So, you know, when I talk about this or when I think about this, I don't want anyone to get um, hung up on a particular number. Um, because those numbers will change as reference groups change and um, as our genetic technologies get better, um, we'll be able to, um, I guess, more closely sort of refine these ancestry groups. I was actually just looking over my um, 23andMe results uh, as well, and I was looking at the reference groups that they have, and I think for European populations, they have over 6,000 people in their reference group. Mm. For Sub-Saharan Africans, it was like 1,300. So much, 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 much smaller. And then keep in mind um, that Africa, right? That's the home to our species. Our, our entire, all humanity comes from this continent. So there's huge amounts of variation um, in Africa and you are not gonna capture it all, right? With just mm -hmm. 1,000 to 1,500 people. So your results are going to continue to change as they refine uh, their, their reference groups. Um, another sort of important thing too is if you had a brother or a sibling who didn't, he might also have slightly different uh, results than you. Okay, and the reason for that is that you get half of your DNA from your mom, half from your dad, but you don't necessarily get the exact same half um, from your mom and your dad that your siblings do. So yeah, that's another reason that you know you might you might see different results. Again, not not because the science is faulty or the statistics are bad. It's just it's just how we are. Yeah, that that makes sense. How how many generations? Um... Do these tests for the DNA go back? How, how, how far back are we going when we're when we getting the whole sort of uh, database together? So that's uh, more of an answer um, that is sort of statistically based. So the mitochondrial lineages, those are really hard to put a sort of timeline um, on. Um, we could just talk sort of more in, in broad generalities as to um, when this emerged. With these unilineal tests, those mitochondrial and why, we're really just talking about what we say is uh, deep ancestry. Right, so we can look at the sort of original, if you will, uh, mitochondrial or Y chromosome type, and then figure out when mutations would have happened um, based on, what we we'll call it a molecular clock, but we know how often these changes can occur. If you've accumulated a lot of changes, it means there's been a lot of time. If you've accumulated uh, just a few, a few changes, not, not as much time. Um, for the autosomal ancestry, this gets also kind of complicated. They can just look at chunks of your DNA that are inherited as a whole, and over time, those chunks will get smaller and smaller and smaller. And you can sort of statistically estimate when those chunks get smaller um, about how much time that's that's been. 
So you are starting to see that in some of these commercially available tests. They are trying to estimate as to when you're European or African or whatever, what have you, ancestry sort of entered your lineage. Okay, that's 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 interesting. Um, I just wonder how precise in terms of location the um, the testing can can get. So, for example, um, part of my 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 um, testing said that I, I have something like 30, 31 percent Ghanaian. Um, would it will any information tell me what part of Ghana or what part of the world exactly? Can we get more detailed information about that? Uh, you can, but not yet. <laughs> um, <Okay. laughs> the, the issue is, again, this reference, the reference groups. Um, when you have, you know, just what, 1,300 people representing this entire continent, it's not going to be great. Um, I have seen studies yeah. um, coming out of parts of Europe, for example. I think there was a study was looking at people in the UK, and they were able to um, pinpoint, you know, within a few kilometers as to where people came from. And it's wow. because they had the genealogical information and they had people who knew that their you know, grandparents and great grandparents had been in this village and this village and this village. So it is possible, but you just have to have the data available and sort of that fine scale resolution. So at, yeah. at some point in the, in the future, hopefully not too far from now, if additional testing um, is done in, in an ideal world, we can get various uh, West African groups to invest in this. Um, yeah to be part of the science and not just selling their information to these companies, but really to be part of it, um, there, there is the possibility of getting finer resolution. That being said, <laughs> we also have to keep in mind the history of, of exactly what the transatlantic slave trade did, right? So there were people who were coming from the hinterlands inside out to the coast um, and then uh, shipped across uh, the Atlantic. Once you're across the Atlantic, you're mixing it up, you're mixing it up. Okay. Yeah. So we're already admixed Africans. We're already admixed on the continent, number one, because people move around. Number two, you come over to the um, across the Atlantic. You're mixing it up there. Um, and then another uh, point to keep in mind is that the names of the tribes and the groups we might be looking for now, they may not have existed or they may have existed in a different form 200 years ago, 500 years ago. We don't have to go that far back in time um, before Europeans went in there starting to draw uh, boundaries for different African groups. You know these nations were different, so it's kind of it's something that it's not as easy uh, upon as as you might think. You know, at face value, like oh, I want to connect with X Y group in Nigeria. Well, did that group exist when your ancestor was taken from there? Yeah. You know, you have to keep this mm -hmm. keep this in mind. And again, what does it what does it mean to share ancestry um, with with different groups? It seems to me that we've um, we've learned an awful lot, but there's there's still a lot more that we can we can learn, and that's I guess the hope and the promise for the future as we get to uh, understand the technology even better. One more time, sorry. <laughs> sorry, um, yeah. I, I think we've, 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 <laughs> we've we've learned quite a lot of information, um, and yet there's still a lot we we still need to find out, and that's the promise of um, of tomorrow. As we get to learn a lot more and the technology gets better uh, and the more people um, will subscribe to um, the, the databases yeah I, I agree and that actually um, plays off of that last question I had I think it's really important that communities or you know interested parties are aware of the technology what it can tell us and what it can't tell us um, and to find ways to actively maintain control of how that data is used um, because um, you know this this data can just as it can be used to help us learn more, um, it can be used against us as well. So it's important to kind of keep these caveats in mind. Yeah, fantastic. Um, um, Jay, thanks I have so a question. I'm back I over to Angus. Okay. Um, back to looking at uh, Grenada doesn't have a visible Amerindian descent population like Dominico or even St. Vincent. But several people have family stories of Amerindian Kalina slash Kalinago heritage. Could you speak to that specifically to Grenada? If you, I don't know um, any specific details about Grenada, but I can speak in generalities. Okay. Um, so I hadn't, I didn't get it, um, a chance to mention it because I wanted to move through. But you know, in this newest project I did in Puerto Rico, um, I have looked at, I have really high resolution data on about thirty individuals. So these are again our Afro Puerto Rican. In these thirty individuals, I see evidence of indigenous paternal ancestry. Okay, so like the QM three along that Y chromosome. There have been uh, plenty of studies since I think about 2000 that have looked at general populist Puerto Ricans. Um, and I think they have well over uh, a thousand 
so maybe around 1,400 people they've looked at, they have never seen the Y chromosome come up um, as indigenous in the general populace. So this is sort of my working hypothesis is that um, a lot of these indigenous populations didn't just go extinct. They went to areas outside of European purview where they just wouldn't be seen. And you know who else was there? Africans, okay? So they were mixing it up in ways um, that weren't uh, recorded by European colon uh, colonists, settlers, missionaries, et cetera. So what I think is if you go to the right segments, the right parts of populations in uh, throughout the islands, you're gonna see more indigenous ancestry. So I'm not at all surprised in Grenada that it is showing up, that people have these oral histories. Um, in St. Vincent, I had one participant tell me that after being part of um, my study, she started thinking about herself um, a little bit differently as a Kalinago woman, um, just because of the sort of social history uh, around being identified as indigenous and this being not necessarily a good thing. Um, but she started thinking about herself a little bit, a little bit differently and, and appreciating um, her ancestry, where she came from. So I think that, and along with um, the fact that there are different resurgence movements happening in the Caribbean, where people are increasingly claiming their indigenous ancestry, I think you're going to see more individuals who, who you know, had these oral histories um, and maybe never talked about it publicly, but they know it. Um, people will probably come out a little more and, and, and talk more more about that. Uh, and I think that's going to be really important to capture and to remember and to share uh, with new our newer generation's kids to let them know um, that not all the native populations, you know, were were killed, that they survived. And this is how they survived. And they are in us. Right. Um, we had chatted before um, in, in the case of Grenada at present, there are a number of sites where human remains have been found. Um, so Tez is an example where um, some wave action caused by varying um, things have, have led to human remains being washed into the sea. And we have seen in that case, no one other than the museum, uh, Jonathan Hanna, who's an archeologist there, have taken any kind of action um, or Leiden University to preserve some of these. We've seen little action by the government. We've seen little action by any groups, religious groups, you know, to take some kind of thing and say, hey, these are human remains. You know, how do you think we should approach dealing with human remains for a group of people that we really, um, that we, we lack the connection to, the physical connection, but we may have this genetic connection to? How do you think we should approach that? Oh, I think this is a complicated, a complicated question. Um, these, these do reflect sort of broader issues as to how you as a community, we as a community, what do we think about um, in terms of our relationship, our obligations to the dead? Um, you know, whether you are borrowing these ideas from religious traditions, you might have particular ideas. Um, you might also have some very spiritual connections to, to the land. And part of that land now is, is are these, these, these remains. Uh, so that might guide how you um, interact uh, with with these remains. Um, here in, in the U.S., uh, at least for Native American populations, there are specific federal guidelines that dictate how their remains and, and uh, affiliated cultural items are to be managed, at least on federal land. On private land, it's a little bit, a little bit different. Um, but this is in response to decades of community activism to petition the government for these sorts of protections. Um, I mean, it was not unconceivable um, just, just a few decades ago that you could see the remains of Native Americans in museums and special religious items just you know, for sale um, uh, to anybody who wanted it. Okay, if you feel a connection to that community, if you say, hey, that's, that's my ancestor, that's my grandmother, my great grandmother, et cetera, you're gonna have very strong feelings um, about how the body parts, literally the body parts of the religious artifacts um, are sold. Um, and this again, you know, these changes came from the community. So if people care enough, um, then there has, it has to be sort of a grassroots uh, approach to thinking about, well, what do we want to do with these remains? Do we want to re rebury them? Should they be available to study? If they're going to be studied, how are they going to be handled? Uh, when does the study come to an end? What sort of in engagement that does there need to be um, with, with the community? So yeah, this, this is uh, something that you know, communities have to, to come together. We, right. I, another example would be um, uh, with the New York burial ground. So many years ago, 
um, uh, slave, basically the, the remains of enslaved peoples in New York was found. Um, and there was a lot of community interaction in terms of how those remains were to be handled, who was going to study them and how they were going to be um, reinterred. Um, and we, you know, there's some other great examples of how academia, academics um, and community activists uh, come together uh, and do these, these projects successfully uh, that shows respect to both the remains and to the descendant communities. Right. I think we definitely um, lack that knowledge, I think, that, that, that shows our connection to those um, earlier peoples, you know, that, that have lived on Grenada. I think we, we definitely, even though we do identify in, in a certain way, um, but I still think we lack what is the, how are they a part of us? How are we all part of the same landscape? You know, so I think we need more education in, in showing that connection, you know, for us to be able to say, you know, they are Grenadians as much as we are. So we should basically put forward that we need to take care of their remains as we would take care of our remains, you know. So I think we definitely need to to, to move forward in how we, we approach the Kalinago or any other human, because these are, you know, earlier peoples and the Kalinagos as well, you know. And, and, and the whole, I don't think we, throughout much of these, the Lesser Antilles, we really have a fix on how do we deal with human remains, period, right. you know, so. Um, Looking at um, wait, Angus, one more point um, on that is uh, I have a, some colleagues who are archaeologists, and you know some of them have have mentioned like you know we don't often come across the remains of uh, enslaved peoples, mm -hmm. um, but you know when we do, you know there's always these, these issues as to to what happens to them, and I imagine that if a huge cache of uh, human remains from enslaved people were to be unearthed, that a lot of people would have opinions, strong opinions, as to how those remains should be handled, maybe because they understand or feel more of an affinity uh, to mm -hmm. those to those remains. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, at, on some on some level, we, we we might celebrate that the remains haven't been found because, you know, because these, these structures are not in place as to how to in, engage and interact uh, with these remains and then descendant communities, uh, you know, you might want to wait until those things exist before these remains are unearthed, or it actually might force a conversation. Um, right. If right. That would have happened. Yeah. Hey, Philip, do you want to continue with some of the questions that we've been getting from the audience? Yes, absolutely. Comments as well as questions. Um, Jonathan says, "Are there any companies that have better reference groups for African diaspora? For instance, African ancestry." claims to have higher resolution on specific regions and tribes within modern African nations. Yeah, so I haven't done my homework with these different um, uh, these different companies, so I don't know exactly what um, their reference groups um, consist of. Um, in terms of African ancestry, um, the scientific director, um, Rick Kittles, was my uh, one of my graduate uh, advisors, and I, I did a postdoc uh, in his lab. So, um, I know that he's worked extent very, very hard in improving his um, his reference group. So, I mean, if, if this is if that's the particular type of ancestry that you are interested in, I would recommend going, you know, and looking and doing your own homework in, in terms of um, learning more about the reference groups um, that are available and what genetic markers are are used. Um, but again, that's a really important point uh, to think about what reference populations uh, are are there. Then we have. Um they're asking you, so the percentage of DNA that you get from each parent is always the same, but the makeup is different. Is that what you are saying? That is what I'm saying, yes. So you get half from your mom, roughly half from your mom, roughly half from your dad. Um, and unless you are an identical twin, um, you're still gonna share 50% with your sibling, it's just your 50% can look a little bit different. All right, another question. When you examine the admixture of current day Lesser Antilles residents, how do you think about past migration to the US, Canada, UK, et cetera, and how that might have skewed the admixture that is present today? And you did speak to that um, during the presentation. Yeah, you know, that um, is an, actually another project that um, both, uh, actually was my husband's idea, um, um, but it was specifically in regards to Puerto Rico um, and thinking about what Puerto Ricans, which Puerto Ricans ended up migrating. 
versus those that stayed. And the same thing with Cuba. Like when I, I had the good fortune to go to Cuba some years ago, and I had no idea that there were so many people of African descent on the island. My ideas of what Cubans look like were the ones you see in Florida. Um, and no, when you look in the history just a little bit more, you see uh, that there are certain segments of the Cuban Cuban um, society that went, that migrated, and those that stayed. So the ancestry might look a little bit different. Um, in addition, some of the studies I've seen that come out of Cuba, um, it's clear to me that they are set, they're only um, sampling a sub segment of the population, but not necessarily a, a clean snapshot of, of Cuban populations. In terms of the Lesser Antilles, that would be a really interesting study um, to do. But my understanding is that um, fam not, not entire families didn't necessarily leave the islands, but just members of, of families. Um, and, I, you know, this might be a really interesting study to, to look at the ancestry uh, of those who left versus those who stayed and, and see if there's any significant um, differences. But um, I, I can't speak on that right now because I've, I've never done that. Right. Got it. Got it. I think, I think anecdotally, you could probably say that a lot of the more whiter Grenadians or from some of these other places would have left as a result of the breakdown of the plantation system. You know, I think you had... I think when you look at some of the families, you can see that, you know, people may have decided to return home or have gone to another island. You know, I think we do see some of the movement of the elites, you know, after the breakdown, you know, in the, in the, in the mid 1800s or even late 1800s, even again, you know, in the mid 1900s, you know, after we had incidents like Sky Red and stuff in Grenada. So you do see that exodus, you know, at different places in, in different islands, you know, which will account for, for now what we see in the island today. Yeah. yeah, Stanley says his oldest uncle always said that my great great grandfather was of Ghanaian Ashanti slave descent, but DNA tests consistently show that Stanley is 27% Nigerian. The Ghanaian side is only about 9%. Do you have any idea why this might be? Um, you know, yeah, I, again, don't, I wouldn't get caught up in the percentages as much because those will change uh, as reference groups change. Um, in addition, uh, keep in mind that, again, once we came across the Atlantic, we became admix. We started mixing it up. It would just depend on, you know, who was available, what, what uh, make choices people had. Um, there are some um, historical references we could look at that, that uh, look at different archives, slave census records, et cetera, that can tell you more information in terms of the, the broad um, sort of tribal affiliations that people had. At the same time, you have to keep in mind that the people recording this might not have been as careful as we might, <laughs> we might be. Um, so it's hard to interpret um, what, what the, why it's only 9% when you have a, a direct lineage um, to it. I think the most important point, though, is just to remember, um, you know, the family histories um, and that you do see at least a nod of it in your a nod to it in, in your in your ancestry. Right. Um, another thing, again, to keep in mind is what do we mean when we're talking about when we say Ghanaian? Um, we have to think about when those borders that make up modern day Ghana and modern day Nigeria, when those were drawn. Those were not drawn back in 17 whatever. Right. Um, when your ancestor may have been taken. In fact, the Ghanaian and the Nigerian might have been part of a, uh, a broader sort of uh, community or, or uh, population. Um, and only now we're imposing these names on it. Um, so there's a lot of caveats to thinking about how, how to interpret what that, exactly what that 9% means versus that 27%. Right. Speaking Craig, Craig spoke to this. He says, I like to think that ethnic um, estimates actually tell you what part of the world your ancestors were walking around in about 500 years ago. Um, nothing to do with how they'd self-identify racially, just their location on the planet. Uh, that's fair. Mm -hmm. Great response. And what were you going to say, Angus? Um, I was I was thinking when you we talking about oral history and and family histories and things. We, look we could think specifically of Karaku and Pitti Martinique, where we have cultural practices like the big drum dance or, you know, where people identified with specific areas or groups, you know. Wouldn't you think that that's a really good population to work with in terms of trying to connect with that oral history with the genetic history? You know, I know now it's probably a little more complicated because 
you know, people have mixed and, and, and so, you know, compared to when we actually, you know, have this stuff. But do you think that you would get probably more interest in percentages as opposed to a larger place like Grenada or, you know, somewhere like that? Yeah, those, those sorts of studies can be difficult um, to do because your sample sizes just aren't going to be large because your population uh, isn't large. Right. Um, in addition, you know, just because with small communities, if you go back a few generations, you're going to again see these, these cross cousin marriages. Um, from the standpoint of genetic testing and, and, and how our statistics work, um, in an ideal situation, you really want to get people who are unrelated. Um, but still part of a population. So it can complicate things kind of working with, with small groups. Um, but I think that you're absolutely right uh, that the oral histories can be really useful place to start to start from uh, to explore, explore the genetics. That's kind of what I did in uh, Jamaica with the Acompong town, Maroons. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, speaking I, from your own perspective in, in being American, but having Caribbean roots, um, how did you find out about your own genetics? How did that contribute to your, how you identify? Is there, is there a correlation between that or? Oh yeah, yeah. So my parents are from Trinidad. Um, I was able to get my Trinidadian passport and in my house, it's, it, it was always Trinidad. Um, and that, that, was, that was clear to me from, from day one. Um, in terms of my sort of career, things sort of just came together at the right time, the right place. I had, I was just prepared in terms of the science and the, and the education. Um, but when these technologies began to emerge, I, I was just, again, at the right place to be able to say, hey, we can use this to learn more about the Caribbean. I chose to work in the Caribbean specifically because I wanted to know more about my own family and my family's history. Um, I could have done this in any other part of the world. Okay, I know Trinis might get on me for this, but just in case, you might be Grenadian too. <laughs> right. <laughs> my mother says a couple of us have, uh, have uh, come from there. Yeah. <laughs> it's not that we're trying to claim you or anything, but just telling you the way the history, the migration work, you just might be a few generations before that Grenadian. <laughs> and that would that would be an interesting thing to look at, you know, the movement of people around the Caribbean itself. You yes. know, in looking at the genetic data and, and where these populations come from, because we know that in Trinidad in the late 1700s, the early 1800s and even 1900s, lots of people were going in from the other islands, from the French mm -hmm. islands first and then from the British, from St. Vincent and Grenada, especially, you know, so that is cre that's created an interesting connection, you know, um, historically. So I could imagine genetically as well. Yes, yes. Again, it's kind of interesting. As I mentioned, I tested with 23andMe years ago, and every once in a while they'll send me new results. And they've added a new um, a new part of their results where they're looking at your recent ancestry in the Americas. And right now, mine is hitting with uh, Jamaica as the most likely. Um, and then I think, uh, I know Trinidad's um, also uh, on that list. But I think as more people, particularly people from the Caribbean, start going there, they're going to get better at mm -hmm. telling you, which, which is interesting from a genealogical perspective. From a social perspective, you know, it's it's a little nerve wracking to know that from a spit sample they can tell you, oh, you know, you're from this part of the world, and be right. <laughs> um, I guess specifically now that you've mentioned that the issue of privacy, mm -hmm. how would you, knowing that this information is becomes in a way public, um, how did you, how would you, what would you suggest for people who are considering doing this test, uh, knowing what you know? Consider it very carefully. Know why you're doing this. Um, it, it is a pain in the neck to do it, but read the fine print. Know exactly what you're putting out there. Also be aware that when you send your DNA in, yes, it's from you, but it's also gonna tell something about your siblings, something about your parents, all about your family. Um, that, will, that will be out there. Um, it was a class I taught just this past semester in the fall, and I think um, it was based on uh, uh, law enforcement was able to find a serial killer that had eluded them for decades, um, but it was through using GEDmatch. So GEDmatch is a third party application. So basically people might test with 23andMe or Ancestry.com. They can download their own raw data and then upload it to this third party, to GEDmatch, um, and then use um, the tools on GEDmatch to connect with other people. Um, that have tested maybe with other companies. So it's a phenomenal tool to be able to expand your sort of genetic genealogical search 
Well, law enforcement was able to do this and they were able to identify um, a relative of someone uh, that was you know, related to the serial killer. And then they were able to hone in on the serial killer, which again is a good thing. We don't want serial killers you know, circulating uh, in the population. But a lot of people were upset because um, they didn't know that their DNA would be used. Would be used, right. This. Because it could be used in other ways. It could be used um, in other ways. And I think um, the same article I read talked about once roughly 2% of the population, meaning mainly European Americans, um, have uploaded like their data to GEDmatch, you'll be able to identify probably 95% of the uh, white population. Wow. Yeah. From and that small percent. From a small percent, yes, because of ultimately we are all related. Um, sure. So, you know, my sense of things is that if we are gonna go down this road, then everybody needs to be in, not just some people, mm -hmm. but everybody. Um, I'm not sure how it works in, in, the, um, in the different islands, but in the U.S., there's also a state and federal systems where they collect DNA, either from arrestees or, or those convicted of particular crimes. Right. Um, and these databases tend to be biased um, mm -hmm. towards uh, black and brown people because those are the people who are arrested um, more often, even for similar offenses. Um, so there's some biases in the, inherent in the system, which then skews uh, the genetic database. Okay, which then means the law can't be applied equally to everybody because these systems are going to be better at catching the people in the database. And if those people are arrested, not because they're committing more crimes, but because they are black or brown, there's a problem. Sure. If we're going to use this technology and it might be a really good tool for law enforcement, again, it has to be something that everybody is in. Um, Craig is asking, can you talk about how we don't actually have DNA from every single one of are thousands of direct ancestors since some of it gets crowded out. Is there another caveat to bear in mind when looking at your own admixture um, or are there really other factors? Yeah, and that's related to that point I was making about pedigree collapse. I could go into more, more detail about that. Um, and this is more of a thought, thought exercise, um, but there are people in your family tree who you actually don't share DNA with. And what happens um, here um, is that every, I was thinking about going back to the image, um, but every time um, you basically make a sex cell, a gamete, your DNA is shuffled, okay? Um, and then once it's shuffled, it gets inherited, but not everything might, in that shuffling, not everything gets uh, represented. If I could go back, can I share my screen one more time? Uh, yes, you certainly can. Okay. And let's jump to this. Okay. So if we look um, at this son, you'll notice that his chromosomes here, these autosomal chromosomes, are a mosaic of his past, uh, of his ancestors here. And this is, this is simplified just to explain things. So you see in this great uh, grandparent uh, generation, everybody's got these sort of has uh, a chromosome that is blue, yellow, pink, and green. Again, uh, showing sort of uh, ancestry from um, their, their families. So this process of recombination, um, what it uh, also means is that there are segments of DNA from your ancestors that you will not inherit, okay? Um, so this individual, for example, um, only has a tiny bit of, let's say, pink here. Uh, but uh, this, this pink um, relative was definitely a relative. 
if this person were to go on and have a, an offspring, very little to no pink might show up. Okay, it doesn't mean that this person wasn't their ancestor. It just means through the processes of recombination, it's sort of just lost over time. Okay, so that's sort of one of those other caveats, again, related to, to this pedigree collapse uh, and thinking about how much these ancestry tests actually tell us about uh, the entirety of our of our family tree. Jada, um, some of the viewers are saying that we lost um, your audio while you, were oh, no. while you were talking about the slide. Um, so they're asking if you could repeat the last couple of minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So does everybody see the uh, the slide, the PowerPoint? Do you all see it? Uh, I'm not sure now you hear me. Uh, do you all see the PowerPoint? Oh, uh, no. Okay, I'm not hearing anybody, and I all my other um, guests are gone. Oh, we're here. Okay, you're here. Okay, yes. I was afraid that I lost you all, and that. Okay, <laughs> I will. Let me see if I can uh, try and do this. Do you all see the slide now? And I'm heard. I don't know. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Okay. So what I was saying, um, I was describing this process known as recombination. Uh, so recombination occurs when we make our sex cells, so sperm or, or eggs, depending off we're male or, or female. Um, and what happens when this process of recombination is that our genes will get shuffled. So I was using this example of the great grandfather here who's pictured in blue. And you'll see he's got one chromosome that's a solid blue and another one that's speckled with, uh, with black dots. In the process of um, gamete formation, recombination occurs. And you'll see that his chromosome now uh, that this that the grandfather has inherited from his father uh, consists of both a speckled section and a solid section and another speckled section. Okay, so uh, the great grandfather, his DNA gets shuffled, um, and that shuffled DNA is what the grandfather uh, inherits. Okay, and you see um, in this father. Okay, so now the third generation that the chromosome that this person has inherited is a little bit blue and a little bit yellow. Okay, and it's representing the recombined uh, DNA from the great-grandfather, great-grandmother. Um, and uh, you see that represented here in this chromosome that is now uh, two colors. And we could do the same thing uh, with this other, other, other chromosome, this pink and green uh, chromosome. What we see down here at the bottom in the sun is that uh, there's a little bit of pink okay, represented in the chromosome. And that um, apparently is coming from the great um, great grandmother, let's say, yeah, great grandmother. Okay, um, what would happen over time is that when this son had offspring, that pink segment is going to get smaller and smaller, um, and at some point will no longer be represented in uh, his line. Again, this doesn't mean that you're not related. It just means through the process of recombination, it gets lost over time. So this is one of those other caveats uh, about thinking about how much uh, our ancestry test can actually tell us about the entirety. Uh, of your ancestry. So just because um, the ancestry test doesn't necessarily pick it up, it doesn't mean that you're not related to this individual. It just means that either the ancestry test isn't high enough resolution to capture it, or through the processes of recombination, um, you don't share any DNA uh, with, with um, that ancestor, even though they're an ancestor. What this really leads us to, to, to think about is uh, our ideas surrounding what it means to be related to someone. Do you have to share DNA? Do you have to share blood with someone to be related to them? Uh, looking at this and thinking about this combination of, uh, combination because of recombination, uh, the answer to that is, is essentially no, not really. Um, but again, it's more, more uh, complicated and a very interesting thought exercise. Presumably you have to go pretty far back not to have DNA, a DNA match with um, someone who's related to you then. I'd imagine. Right, right. And, you know, depending on the question that you're interested in, that may matter to you and it may not. Okay. Well, I think that covers all the questions and comments that we had. So, Angus or Steve, if there's something else, we will bring this to a close. Yeah. Um, I guess I would just want to say,
Jada, thank you very much. I really yes. appreciate you taking the time to engage with us. Absolutely. You know, I think Absolutely. this is really important. I think it's important for people to understand, you know, especially from someone like yourself who does research across the region, to be able to give us that perspective, you know, and engage us. I think oftentimes we don't have the academics engaging us on this level and answering our questions. So I think it's really good that you take the time to do this and to share your knowledge and um, of the region, not just of l smaller places within the Caribbean, but of the, you know, that we are learning things about Puerto Rico, you know, as well as we're about the Les Antilles. So I, I really appreciate you taking the time and agreeing to come on this forum and, and, and allowing people to ask questions and engage, you know, with something that is really important, I think, to people, and that allows us, you know, to expand the whole idea of identity. You know, so. Well, good. Thank you for the invite. I, I really appreciate it. And um, if possible, could you would, would there be some way to save the chat? I'd be interested in looking at the questions in a little more detail. It's, it's always fun for me to think about what people are thinking about as they engage and, and take these tests. And um, it's my hope, you know, that talking with you all will start to spur uh, conversations about these technologies and how uh, we want to employ them in our in our own communities. Sure, sure. I would like to add that in a few weeks' time, we will have a further a conversation on genetic genealogy by looking at the specifics. How do you organize yourself in finding your relatives? So someone, um, uh, uh, a person on part of our page, uh, Craig is going to do a presentation on actually how he has gone about finding relatives using DNA. Um, and how he has organized groups to do that, you know. So the specifics of how you actually go about and and trace, you know, people finding relatives that they did, didn't know they didn't have and, and things like that. So that would be the next step. So thanks so much, Jada, um, for giving us this opportunity to engage with you. Yes. All right. There's a lot of people saying thank you. Um, <laughs> Thank you for the knowledge. Thank you for the time. Much appreciated. Uh, let's have more. Thank you, Dr. Um, J.D. Ventura's. I will reach out to you. Hey. Dr. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, Lorik Wilmot, um, okay. Boston Northeastern University. Sovereign Sire says, great information. Thank you. And it just keeps coming and coming and coming. Right. So people were really happy with this presentation. Yeah, it was very and good. It was requested since last year. Not that last year was that far away, but again, thank you very much. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all. All right. Take care, okay. everybody. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.